Hello, friends. Welcome to part six of our journey through the American story. Fortunately for you, this is the final part. This part starts with America being on the successful side of World War II, finding itself in a Cold War, and ends with the election of President Trump in 2016. Before we start, I want to address a few comments to the Chapter 26 video. If you have questions you would like me to address in this space in the future, leave a comment and I will consider making it part of the next video. Hi, Alyssa Kitchen. No, Akash, the Lorax is not the best Dr. Seuss book. And longtime follower Bernadette asked me to say something about Josh. There, I said his name. That is something, right? There is a saying for this. How does it go? If you don't have something nice to say, don't say anything at all. Something like that. Moving on. The Cold War with the Soviet Union was waged on land, in the minds of people, and in space. Success was determined by who had the most missiles, most powerful rockets, most deaths on a field of battle in a country not called the United States or the Soviet Union, the most converts to a capitalist or communist mindset, the best propaganda, or who could plant their flag on the moon. It would dominate nine presidencies, Truman, Eisenhower, Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, Ford, Carter, Reagan, and Bush Sr., Today, we will consider President Truman's attempt to contain the spread of communism both abroad and in the United States. It's Chapter 27, The Cold War and the Fair Deal. With 15 million Americans returning home from the war, there was going to be an inevitable change to the American economy. In order to help these servicemen reorient themselves into peacetime America, Congress passed the Servicemen's Readjustment Act in 1944, better known as the GI Bill. I am sure that there are many of your parents who have benefited from this act of Congress, or even some of you will have your college paid for by the GI Bill. The goal of the bill was to help get servicemen into college and into homes. We will talk about the homes created in the suburbs in Chapter 28. Veterans were given money for a four-year college, college education, access to low-interest loans for houses that did not require a down payment, and $20 a week for a year to allow them time to find a job. While the 1950s is viewed as an age of affluence similar to the 1920s, the period right after the war that saw the conversion from wartime production to consumer production was rocky. The women who stepped up and filled the vacancies left by men going off to fight in the Pacific and in Europe found themselves replaced by these very men upon their return from the war. With the war ending, there was no longer the demand for tanks, airplanes, and other weapons of war. The demand for oil and coal declined with the American war machines returned to the United States. This resulted in increased unemployment. There was an increase from 1.2% in 1944 to 3.9% in 1946 and to 6.6% 6 .6 by 1949. Now, these numbers are not high historically, especially when compared to what Americans lived through during the Great Depression. But they do help us understand the sluggish American economy and response by workers in the immediate aftermath of the Second World War. There was a prevailing fear that the American economy would dip back into a depression after the war. Ultimately, the resulting recession, not depression, would be short-lived as a result of an American public ready to buy consumer goods in large numbers for the first time since the stock market crashed in 1929, increased military spending, and the movement back to a wartime economy when the United States would send troops into Korea in 1959. Congress refused to continue the wartime control of the economy like we had during World War II, overriding Truman's veto, resulting in falling wages and dramatically increased inflation. The year 1946 brought on a new wave of strikes across the United States as a result of this sluggish economy. There were strikes in many industries important to the well-being of the American economy. When John L. Lewis orchestrated a strike by United Mine Workers, American coal fields were shut down for 40 days. Truman responded by having the government seize the mines and pressuring the owners to come to an agreement to get workers back on the job. The country could not function without coal. Also in 1946, railroads were shut down throughout the United States for the first time. We have talked about major railroad strikes in the past, the Great Railroad Strike of 1877 and the Pullman Strike in 1894, but this was the first time that all railroads were shut down. Workers returned to work after a couple of days when Truman threatened to have the army run the trains. In 
If a president wants to present a reform package for the United States, it is a good idea to brand it. Teddy Roosevelt had the square deal, Wilson the new freedom, and FDR, of course, had the new deal. Truman's 21-point plan was known as the fair deal. It called for expanding Social Security benefits, increasing the minimum wage, creation of a permanent Fair Employment Practices Act, increasing public housing availability, the promotion of scientific research, and national health care. During the remainder of his first term in office, most of this policy agenda would be defeated. Truman did not have a great relationship with Republicans in Congress, and the Cold War would start to heat up during his presidency. In the midterm elections of 1946, Republicans gained control of both houses of Congress for the first time since the Hoover administration. Truman was relatively unpopular and his party was running during an economic downturn. Historically, the president gets the blame or credit for the economy and Truman took the blame in 1946 and his party lost control of Congress. This political cartoon is a pretty good depiction of Truman's relationship with Republicans after they took control. Upon seizing control of both houses of Congress in 1946, Republicans looked to dismantle New Deal reforms and reject any Fair Deal reforms. They reduced government spending and wrote legislation to deregulate the economy. They refused to distribute funds for education and Social Security. There would be no increase in the minimum wage. Republicans also passed the Taft-Hartley Act over the president's veto. This act limited, act limited the power of labor unions. And finally, Congress passed and the states ratified the 22nd Amendment, which limited the, the president to two terms in office. The George Washington standard was now part of the Constitution. This political cartoon from 1939 showed how many, how many of FDR's critics viewed the decision to run for a third and later fourth term in office. Truman's unpopularity caused a divide within the Democratic Party. He believed that Americans were not turning their backs on the New Deal and would fight back against Republicans in Congress. But it was not just Republicans who Truman found himself opposed by. When President Truman came out in favor of civil rights legislation and even adding civil rights to the Democratic Party's platform in 1948, Southern conservatives walked out of the convention, formed the state's rights party, better known as the Dixiecrats, and nominated Strom Thurmond as their candidate for president. Thurman, running on support of Jim Crow, won less than 3% of the popular vote, but won 39 electoral votes, all in the South, in 1948. Southern Democrats were not, were not the only ones looking for a new candidate in 1948. Liberal Democrats formed a new progressive party and nominated FDR's third vice president, Henry Wallace. They found the policies of Truman ineffective and they thought he was too confrontational with the Soviet Union. And still, a third group of Democrats wanted to drop Truman and get Dwight Eisenhower, the hero of D-Day, to run as the Democratic nominee. When he refused, these Democrats accepted Truman as the nominee for the election of 1948. And in that election, Truman traveled the country running against what he called the do-nothing, good-for-nothing Republican Congress. Giving 365 speeches, he talked about repealing Taft-Hartley for workers, civil rights legislation for African Americans, and price supports for farmers. It was assumed by most that Truman had, would lose to New York Governor Thomas Dewey, who had lost four years earlier to FDR. Dewey's lead was seemingly so high that most pollsters stopped polling the race. But in the end, Truman won a close selection in the popular vote, but a decisive one in the Electoral College. Also, Democrats retook control of both houses of Congress. The election also gave us this iconic photograph of Harry Truman holding up the headline published in the, in the Chicago Daily Tribune the day after the election. They were so confident in Truman's defeat, they went with this headline. That is not what happened. With Democrats now controlling the White House and Congress, Truman's fair deal would get reevaluated. And while his new full term in office would come to be dominated by the Cold War, 
the minimum wage would almost double. 10 million more Americans would be eligible for Social Security. There would be more public housing constructed. The president would order an end to the discrimination in government hiring. And, US, and the U.S. military would finally be integrated. Gone were the days of separate units for black soldiers. But Truman did not get everything he wanted from this Congress. There would be no national health care and no federal aid for education. And while there were some positive steps for African Americans during this time, there was no anti-lynching law, no protection for black voters, and the poll tax was still legal. The civil rights movement will start in chapter 28. The Truman presidency, like every other presidency during the Cold War, would be dominated by foreign policy. The Cold War emerged out of World War II. When the war ended, the former allies, the United States and Soviet Union, found themselves as the only two superpowers on the planet. During World War II, FDR had told a friend, quote, I can't take communism, nor can you, but to cross this bridge, I would hold hands with the devil, unquote. With the war over, these one-time allies became adversaries. They would vie for influence throughout the world. The United States was influenced by its founding documents. Wilson's vision for the world found in his 14 points at the end of World War I and the Atlantic Charter at the start of World War II. In the Cold War, America stood for the promises of capitalism and democracy. The United States had the advantage of being the only country with the atomic bomb for a few more years, and a country that did not get attacked during World War II, except for Pearl Harbor. The Soviet Union was inspired by the ideas of the Russian Revolution and the writings of Vladimir Lenin. In the Cold War, the Soviet Union stood for the promises of communism. The Soviet Union had the Red Army, one of the biggest armies in the world at the time. No country was too small to escape Cold War tensions. Greece, Turkey, Hungary, Egypt, Cuba, Korea, Vietnam, Afghanistan, and even Grenada are only a few examples of hotspots during the Cold War. Both sides would build arsenals unlike anything the world had ever seen. Bombers and missiles, nuclear bombs and rockets designed to land a man on the moon were developed with the goal of always being the first and having the most. The Cold War also caused divisions within the United States, with politicians vying for, for who was the toughest against communism. In both the elections of 1946 and 1948, the Cold War was a major theme, with Truman having to, having to defend himself against Republicans, charging him that he was soft on communism. And you'll notice the pictures there. In my opinion, there's no better way to portray an enemy than to draw them as a bear. The United Nations was born out of the meetings of the Big Three towards the end of World War II. At Yalta, the plans for the United Nations were hatched. This was a new version of Wilson's failed League of Nations. The goal was for the countries of the world to work together to avoid a third world war. Its charter called for the equal rights of men and women in nations large and small. All countries could join the UN's General Assembly, but the United States, Great Britain, France, China, and the Soviet Union were granted permanent spots on what was called the Security Council. This smaller group of countries had the power to veto any decision. The UN would not take action if one of these five countries vetoed a proposal. In a stark contrast to the debate over the League of Nations, the United States Senate voted 80 to 2 to join the United Nations. At the end of World War II, Stalin had occupied Poland and installed a communist government. He sought a buffer zone in Eastern Europe to create distance between the West and the Soviet Union. At Yalta, he had promised free and unfettered elections for Poland in the future. It would be 50 years before these elections would actually take place. This Soviet buffer zone consisted of satellite nations which were technically independent but were heavily influenced by the Soviet Union. These countries included Poland, Romania, Bulgaria, Albania, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, and East Germany. These satellites stayed within the Soviet atmosphere for decades. In 1946, Winston Churchill gave a speech in Missouri where he famously said, From Stettin in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic, an iron curtain has descended across the continent. Behind that line lie all of the capitals of the ancient states of Central and Eastern Europe. Warsaw, Berlin, Prague, Vienna, Budapest, Belgrade, Bucharest, and Sofia. 
All these famous cities and the populations around them lie in what I must call the Soviet sphere. And all are subject in one form or another, not only to Soviet influence, but to a very high and in many cases increasing measure of control from Moscow. He warned of Soviet actions to create a sphere of influence in Eastern Europe and about Soviet attempts to expand its reach to other parts of the world. Later in the speech, he offered his prognosis for how all of this might play out when he said, if the Western democracies stand together in strict adherence to the principles of the United Nations Charter, their influence for furthering those principles will be immense and no one is likely to molest them. If, however, they become divided or falter in their duty, and if these all-important years are allowed to slip away, then indeed catastrophe may overwhelm us all. George Kennan was a U.S. diplomat working at the American Embassy in Moscow when he sent President Truman what is known as the Long Telegram. In it, he argued that the Soviet Union would not compromise with the West, and he counseled long-term, patient, but firm, vigilant containment of Russian expansive tendencies. The word containment would come to define American foreign policy during the Cold War. Stopping the spread of communism became the goal. This goal would soon be tested by Stalin's actions in Turkey and Greece. The Soviet Union threatened Turkey when it would not allow Soviet ships to freely travel through the Bosphorus and Dardanelles Straits that connect the Black and Mediterranean Seas. In Greece, pro-Soviet forces threatened the pro-Western government. President Truman was forced to act when Great Britain claimed it could no longer support Greece. He went to Congress requesting $400 million to support the free people of Greece and Turkey. In this speech, Truman clearly laid out what was at stake in the Cold War when he said, At the present moment in world history, nearly every nation must choose between alternative ways of life. The choice is too often not a free one. One way of life is based upon the will of the majority and is di distinguished by free institutions, representative government, free elections, guarantees of individual liberty, freedom of speech and religion, and freedom from political oppression. The second way of life is based upon the will of a minority forcibly imposed upon the majority. It, re it relies upon terror and oppression, a controlled press and radio, fixed elections, and the suppression of personal freedoms. I believe that it must be the policy of the United States to support free peoples who are resisting attempted subjugation by armed minorities or by outside pressure. This came to be known as the Truman Doctrine which historian and authority on the Civil War, John Lewis Gaddis, summarizes as an implied American commitment to assist victims of aggression and intimidation throughout the world. This aid to Turkey and Greece was, was the first use of the containment policy and succeeded when the Soviets dropped their demands of Turkey and communist forces were defeated in Greece. In order to keep as many European countries on the American side, the United States Congress passed the European Recovery Program, better known as the Marshall Plan, named after Secretary of State George C. Marshall. The fear of communism spreading into war-torn Europe was a major fear at the time, given the state of Europe after the Second World War. In order to contain this spread, the United States used money to help re rebuild Europe and keep countries on the American side of the ledger. The aid was offered to all of Europe, but Stalin would not allow Eastern European countries under his control to accept the money. All told, the Marshall Plan would send more than $12 billion to Europe, leading to economic recovery in Western Europe. This map shows where the money was distributed. This was another use of the containment policy. Writing about American foreign policy after World War II, historian Jill Lepore writes, after the war, the United States committed itself to military supremacy in peacetime, not only through weapons manufacture and an expanded military, but through new institutions. The institutions she writes about were found in the National Security Act of 1947. The act created the Department of Defense to replace the Department of War, the National Security Council to oversee foreign and military policy, and the Central Intelligence Agency, which is tasked with collecting and analyzing information from, a, from around the world, both openly and covertly. According to the NSC at the time, the role of the CIA included, quote, 
propaganda, economic warfare, preventive direct action, including sabotage, anti-sabotage, demolition, and evacuation measures, subversion against hostile states, including assistance to underground resistance movements, guerrillas and refugee liberation, groups in support of indigenous communist elements in threatened countries of the free world, unquote. We will talk about examples of covert CIA operations in Chapter 28. These agencies showed how the Cold War was changing American foreign policy. They led to more power being put in the hands of the executive branch as well. We will discuss the Cold War at home right after this. Here are a few things I just thought you needed to know. In Denmark, there are twice as many pigs as people. That must be one delicious country. Club Direct, a travel insurance company in Britain, provides insurance plans for protection from falling coconuts. I assume this insures people in other parts of the British Empire. I'm not saying one cannot grow coconuts in Great Britain. Actually, I am. And lastly, male hospital patients fall out of bed twice as often as female patients. For some reason, this just makes sense to me. Before someone asks if this is me in the picture, I can neither confirm nor deny that as a result of pending litigation between myself and a well-known shoe manufacturer. The fear of communism played a major role in shaping the American landscape during the Cold War. As I had mentioned earlier, in the first elections held after World War II, Republicans attacked Harry Truman for being soft on communism. The House on American Activities Committee was not created during the Cold War. It was actually created in 1938 to identify supposed communists in the American government. During the Cold War, HUAC, as it's known, would play an increased role in governing the United States. With Truman as president, public hearings were used to expose how communists had infiltrated the government because of a lack of democratic action. Government officials, Hollywood, and even the Boy Scouts were said to have been infiltrated by communists. The hearings would be very public with investigators normally having made up their minds about their targets before the hearings even took place. One of the more famous investigations was the, it was the 1947 investigation of the film industry. When several writers, producers, and directors refused to answer questions about their own and their colleagues' political beliefs, they were jailed for contempt of Congress for a year. Many of the Hollywood 10, as they came to be known, were put on blacklists, meaning no one in the industry would hire them, as Hollywood did not want to be associated with those with supposed suspicious loyalty. Truman responded to these attacks by issuing Executive Order 9835, which created the Federal Loyalty Program. This allowed for a review of, loyal, of the loyalty of federal employees, leading to 2,000 people resigning and 212 being fired for being what was called bad security risks. It also established a list of sub subversive organizations that would be harassed by FBI investigations led by Director J. Edgar Hoover. The McCarran Act required all communist organizations to register with the government. The act was passed over Truman's veto. It is important to understand that there were communists in the United States at the time, just like there are today. There were also those who were sympathetic to the Soviet Union. During this time, it was assumed that if you that you were an enemy of the state if you had any ties to socialism or communism. These images come from a comic book published in 1947. It shows the, what American life would be like once American communists overthrow the government. These images have a pretty easy point of view to understand. Here are a few more examples. I am not sure you need me to explain them to you. These pages come from the, the, the first pages of the book. Take a second, pause the video, and read these to understand the mindset of many Americans during the second Red Scare. There are a few high-profile cases involving espionage by Americans. One of the most famous is Alger Hiss. When Whitaker Chambers, a soon-to-be-fired senior editor at Time magazine, was outed as a communist and then a Soviet spy by HUAC, he testified that a high-ranking State Department official, Alger Hiss, was also a communist. Hiss had been with FDR at the Yalta Conference towards the end of World War II. 
While there seemed to be a lack of evidence indicating Hiss was a Soviet spy, Richard Nixon, a member of the House of Representatives who was elected in the Republican takeover of Congress in 1946, worked tirelessly as a member of HUAC to prove charges levied by Chambers. Ultimately, Hiss went to prison for perjury as he could not be convicted of espionage because, of, because the statute of limitations had expired. Nixon's star in the Republican Party grew quickly. In 1950, the same year Hiss was convicted, Nixon was elected to the Senate from California. And two years later, he would be elected Vice President of the United States. Another high profile case involved Julius and Ethel Rosenberg and the submission of nuclear secrets to the Soviet Union. Following the Soviet Union's first successful detonation of an atomic bomb in 1949, Cold War tensions dramatically increased. After Carl Fuchs and David Greenglass testified that they had provided Russian agents with details about American nuclear weapons, attention turned to Greenglass's sister Ethel and her husband Julius. Greenglass claimed that the Rosenbergs were the masterminds of the plot to get this information into the hands of the Soviet Union. While this trial is considered to be controversial by some, the couple would be convicted in 1951 and on June 19, 1953, would become the first and only Americans executed for espionage during peacetime. One last example of the Red Scare at home is the career of Senator Joseph McCarthy of Wisconsin. McCarthy was a Republican elected to Congress during the Republican takeover of Congress in 1946. In his campaign, McCarthy claimed that his opponent's campaign was funded by communists. On February 9, 1950, Senator McCarthy gave a speech in Wheeling, West Virginia, that would thrust him directly into the center of the Red Scare when he said, while I cannot take the time to name all of the men in the State Department who have been named members of the Communist Party, I have here in my hand a list of 205 names that were made known to the Secretary of State as members of the Communist Party and who nevertheless are still working in shaping the policy of the State Department. McCarthy was lying. He had no list. He had no names. McCarthy became the leading voice for those who believed that the government was being overrun by communists under the Truman administration. The problem, he had no evidence. One of the loudest voices against McCarthy was Margaret Chase Smith, a moderate Republican senator from Maine. Smith was the first woman to serve in both houses of Congress. When she ran for president in 1964, she became the first woman to have her name placed in nomination at a major party convention. In 1950, in a speech known as a Declaration of Conscience, Smith went after McCarthy, a member of her own party, when she said, Surely it is clear that this nation will continue to suffer as long as it is governed by the present ineffective democratic administration. Yet to displace it with a Republican regime embracing a philosophy that lacks political integrity or intellectual honesty would prove equally disastrous to this nation. This nation sorely needs a Republican victory, but I don't want to see the Republican Party ride to a political victory on the four horsemen of calumny. Fear, ignorance, bigotry, and smear. I doubt if the Republican Party could, simply because I don't believe the American people will uphold any political party that puts political exploitation above national interest. After Republicans took control of the Senate in 1952, McCarthy was put in a position to run highly publicized hearings full of claims of communist subversion in the government. McCarthy's tactics, which would go unchallenged by Truman's successor, Dwight Eisenhower, would end after he attacked Secretary of the Army Robert Stevens. His Army McCarthy hearings were among the first congressional hearings to be televised. These hearings allowed for people to see McCarthy as a bully, tossing around baseless accusations against the Army. He was condemned by the Senate in 1954 for, for conduct unbecoming a senator and died three years later of cirrhosis of the liver, a result of his alcoholism. A plan to divide Germany by the Allies had been outlined at Yalta. The three Western zones, controlled by the United States, Great Britain, and France, were combined. The German capital of Berlin, located well inside the Soviet zone, as you can see in the map there, was also divided. In 1948, Stalin decided to blockade Berlin to pressure the West to give up their parts of Berlin. When Truman refused, we had the first major crisis of the Cold War. 
Could this lead to shots being fired between the two adversaries? It would not, but what happened was quite remarkable. Truman ordered Berlin to be supplied by air in what is known as the Berlin Airlift. Over a period of 10 months, 2.5 million tons were flown over Stalin's blockade and dropped into West Berlin. At any point, Stalin could have ordered the planes to be shot down, but he didn't, as he, like Truman, did not want war with the other side. After Stalin ordered an end to the blockade in 1949, Germany was officially divided into the Federal Republic of Germany in the West and the Democratic Republic in the East. Communism would not spread into West Berlin. This is another successful use of the containment policy. The year 1949 was a busy one on the Cold War calendar. After the failure of the Berlin blockade and the division of Germany, there was the creation of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. This was an alliance between the United States and 11, and 11 countries initially designed to protect each other from communist aggression. Countries agreed that an attack on one country was considered to be an attack on all. In response, the Soviet Union would create an alliance with countries of Eastern Europe in 1955 known as the Warsaw Pact. On August 29, 1949, the Soviet Union successfully tested its first atomic bomb a development that shocked and caused fear in many Americans. The United States was ready to move on to bigger, more deadly things when President Truman approved the development of the hydrogen bomb. This would usher in an arms race between the two countries that would define much of the Cold War. The Chinese Civil War had started in the 1920s, but what was interrupted by the Japanese invasion of China in the 1930s. Once the Japanese were defeated, the war started again. Towards the end of 1949, national, nationalist forces under Chiang Kai-shek fell to communist forces under Mao Zedong. Chiang Kai-shek fled to the island of Taiwan and established a government there, while Mao controlled the Chinese mainland, establishing what is known as the People's Republic of China. The United States would not recognize Mao's government as the legitimate government of China until the 1970s. In a report issued by the National Security Council, the United States established itself as the leader of the non-communist world, arguing that the spread of communism must be stopped everywhere. This report was a response to the communist victory in China. According to the report, known as NSC 68, the United States needed to be prepared to provide whatever means necessary to its allies to prevent the potential spread of communism and be prepared for both conventional and nuclear war if necessary. The report called for a massive buildup of weapons, both conventional and nuclear, to match the Soviet Union, which led to a dramatic increase in defense spending that would come to define how the United States would prosecute the Cold War going forward. Korea had been divided along the 38th parallel after Japan was defeated in 1945. The Soviet Union supported the communist government in the North, and the United States supported the pro-Western government in the South. While both sides wanted the peninsula reunified, there was no agreement as the calendar turned to 1950. An alliance emerged between Stalin and Mao after Mao's trip to the Soviet Union in 1949. This agreement said that each side would support the other if attacked. Both sides committed to supporting the communist government in North Korea when it invaded the South in June 1950. Truman went to the United Nations, which agreed to respond. You might be wondering, how did the United Nations approve this if the Soviet Union and China were both on the UN Security Council? Well, since the UN refused to recognize Mao's communist government, the Soviet Union was protesting the UN and thus did not participate in the debate around taking action in Korea. The UN force, dominated by American troops and led by Douglas MacArthur, entered Korea on June 30, 1950. By September 1950, UN forces were pushed back to the southernmost part of the peninsula. It took a surprise amphibious assault by MacArthur at Incheon to push North Korean forces back to the 38th parallel, and eventually to the Chinese border after MacArthur convinced Truman that he could unify the peninsula through attacking the north. Truman ordered MacArthur not to advance all the way to the Yalu River, which, was the which is the border between China and Korea, as the United States did not want the Chinese in the war. 
On November 26, 1950, 300,000 Chinese troops crossed the river and attacked UN forces, pushing them back across the 38th parallel. Both Truman and Stalin threatened to use nuclear weapons. After Truman backed away from this threat, Douglas MacArthur continued to push Truman to allow him to use the atomic bomb to attack China, holding press conferences where he discussed it. During the war, the president went to Wake Island in the Pacific to meet with his commander and told him, we don't want the Chinese in the war, but they're in it. We don't want to do anything to bring Russia in, and you're not going to get the atomic bomb. Now, what are we going to be doing? MacArthur agreed, but later continued to insist on using the bomb, so Truman fired him during the war for insubordination. The war was unpopular and devolved into a stalemate at the 38th parallel, where it all began. The war ultimately ended under Truman's successor, Dwight Eisenhower, with an armistice, but no peace treaty. Korea remains divided with a demilitarized zone, or DMZ, serving as a buffer between North and South. Let's close the show by considering the impact of the Korean War, which is also known as the Forgotten War, as it is that war that took place in between World War II and the Vietnam War. An interesting question is, was this a successful use of the containment policy? Can a tie be seen as a success? If we accept stopping the spread of communism as our guide, then yes, this can be viewed as a success. But ties are not satisfying, unless you like soccer. If you have never been to the Korean War Memorial downtown, I highly recommend it. Next time, we will look at the Eisenhower presidency and what it was like to live in America in the 1950s. Lee and Luke, say goodbye to these fine people. Goodbye! goodbye. Tell them all to wash their hands. Wash your hands! Good night, Albuquerque. Yeah.